Welcome back, guys. It's time for lesson four. So we're going to talk about atoms and solids. I wanted to start from last time. We didn't quite get the board work done. So I wanted to remind you about problem 512 in the book, which was to determine the electronic configurations of some atoms and the corresponding angular momentum and term symbols. So uh, the table of atoms that we're dealing with uh, is right here, table 51 out of the book. And um, we were going to work on 1 through 10 for the configurations, but the interesting part is actually the term symbols, those guys on the right. So, um, and the other problem we talked about is to use Hund's rules to figure out which states of the possible states are the ground states, the lowest energy states, and those are the term symbols in the third column there, or I guess the fourth column. <coughs> the starts with 2s1 half and so on. Now uh, we worked out the term symbols for the first four because they're trivial. They only involve s states in which L is equal to zero and so all you have is s and uh, it's quite obvious how those have to add up. The first really interesting case is boron. So I, I want to treat boron as an example but carbon and nitrogen will work out in class today in detail at the board. But uh, let's, let's look at boron and see what it has to do. So what's the configuration of boron? It's got a helium shell, then it's got two electrons in, the, in a closed S shell, and one sort of trailing electron, a valence electron, in the 2P shell. Now what does that mean? Well, it means L is equal to 1 because it's a P electron, and it means uh, S is equal to a half because there's only one and each electron has a spin of a half. And as you know, J then could either be one plus a half or one minus a half because you can either get the uh, <coughs> the long th th added together, the long or the jackknife when they're uh, subtracted. So you get uh, L plus S and L minus S as possible combinations. Remember when we had two electrons uh, in an S shell, you either have, uh, and you add the two spins together, that you either get S, uh, S total equals 1 or S total equals 0. It's the same idea. The two spins either add or subtract. But here now we've got an orbital and a spin angular momentum, so they either add or subtract. That's sort of how it works out. So what are the possible terms? Well. If J is 3 halves and L is 1 and S is a half, then uh, it would be a P state since L is equal to 1. It would be a 2P state because S is a half. And it would either be 2P 3 halves or 2P 1 half. So those are the possible term symbols. So that's pretty easy. It's actually not that complicated. It gets a little more interesting when you have more than one electron, which we will in class today. But that's the basic idea. Now the question is, of these two term symbols, which one is the ground state? Because uh, remember in the hydrogen atom, energy didn't depend on any of these things, spin, angular momentum, or whatever. But when you have multi-electrons, that electron-electron repulsion means energy now does depend on these properties. So how do we figure out which of these states has the lower energy? That's where Hund's rules come in, and there are three of them. The first rule is to maximize S. <coughs> well, in this problem, there's only one spin that's not in a closed shell, so S is already maximum, it's just a half. If we had more than one electron, of course you'd want to put the spins aligned, so you'd want to have two spins pointing up. Now, if you're in an S shell and you have two spins, there's only room for two spins, so you can't have them both lining, pointing up, because uh, you'd be violating the Pauli exclusion principle. So the rule is you need to maximize S, but you have to also satisfy the Pauli exclusion principle. So in a, in a P shell, you can get three electrons pointing up. If you try to put a fourth one in, then uh, you, you can't put a fourth one in pointing up, and so one has to point down. It goes kind of like that. Anyway, uh, the second rule is you need to maximize L. Uh, so in this case, there is only one L. There is only one electron. L is fixed at 1, so we can't really do anything about L. With more than one electron, of course, it becomes more interesting. And the 
typical issue you run into is you have to maintain the overall anti-symmetric property of the overall wave function. So if the spins are all aligned, that they would have a symmetric combination, and that would mean the L would have to be anti-symmetric. And in, in the case of multiple electrons, that can be a little tricky to figure out, but we'll see how to do it, at least for nitrogen and carbon in class today. But, uh, but that's the idea. You maximize L with the constraint that you have to satisfy the overall asymmetric property of the wave function. And finally, um, if the shell is greater than half full, the J you want to use is L plus S. But if it's less than half full, you want to use L minus S. Well, this shell is certainly less than half full. There's room for six electrons, and we only have one. So that means that uh, J is going to be L minus S. So the correct term is the 2P1 half. That's kind of how it works. Okay. The other thing I want to talk about here is the exchange force. Um, <coughs> we, uh, we talked about a potential board work problem. We never really did this. This actually is related to a homework problem in the book where you'd write out the unnormalized wave function for the three cases of distinguishable fermion and boson when one particle is in the n equals 1 state and one particle is in the n equals 2 state. That's an interesting problem. It's not that hard to do. What I want to talk about now is a follow-up question. What if for those three cases, distinguishable, bosonic, and fermionic, you'd want to compute the expectation value of x1 minus x2 squared. In other words, the expected squared difference between the position of the two particles in those three cases. Um, in order, and we talked about that a little bit, and I know I, I discussed how you calculate that with uh, the bra and ket notation. But what I want to do, just to extend it a little bit, is to talk about how would you handle this using some kind of a computer algebra system. So uh, you could use Sage or Mathematica or uh, you know Maxima. There's a bunch of different computer algebra systems out there. I happen to like Sage most of the time, and so I'm going to demonstrate with that. Okay, guys, I just wanted to point out that uh, you can use symbolic algebra to solve analytical problems in quantum mechanics. Here is the solution using a system called SAGE. Now, SAGE is a, uh, it's a computer algebra system that's free, which is why I like it. Um, we don't have a license for Mathematica at my place, and, uh, and so this is what I've come to use, but uh, of course you can use anything. You could use Mathematica or Maple. There's another free one called Maxima. Um, so, it, you know, whichever you like. The, the point is only that it is possible to use a computer algebra system to calculate things that are uh, complicated to calculate directly on with pencil and paper. Here's, here's an example. We have a wave function. I call it psi f, which is the fermionic wave function. It's the sine of n1 pi x over a times the sine of n2 pi x over a, x2 over a. We have x1 over a here. And we subtract from that the sine of n2 pi x1 over a times the sine of n1 pi x2 over a. So the point is, if you swap x1 and x2 in this wave function, it's anti-symmetric. And that means it's appropriate as a wave function for fermions, which are identical particles that have to have an anti-symmetric wave function. Uh, I just want to print out a solution. This is how you solve for the normalization constant. You say that when you integrate psi f star, psi f, in other words, psi f multiplied by itself, integrated uh, where x1 goes from 0 to a, and x2 goes from 0 to a, you need to get one. So this is the integral, double integral, of uh, the product psi f squared, where x1 goes from 0 to a and x2 goes from 0 to a, and we're demanding that it be equal to one, and we're solving for the unknown, the only unknown, of course, is the normalization constant. So we're going to print that out, but then I happen to know the answer is the square root of 2 over a for the normalization constant. Um, and so the, uh, I'm going to put that in, but here I'm going to calculate psi f times psi f times x1 minus x2 squared, and again x1 goes from 0 to a and x2 goes from 0 to a, uh, and print out the answer. So this is going to compute, using the correct normalization, the 
expectation value of x1 minus x2 squared. Then it's the same thing, but with the bosonic wave function. Here we get a plus. The normalization constant is the same. And we get a plus here to make the wave function symmetric with respect to x1 and x2. And we print out the expectation value of exactly the same integral, but now using the bosonic form of the wave function. And finally, in the distinguishable case, there's no particular symmetry at all. The normalization constant then is not the square root of 2 over a, but just 2 over a. Okay, And, uh, and we print out the same expectation value for that one. If we go ahead and run this, uh, Sage, you can run it in a web browser, but I like to run it from the command line because I'm that kind of a person. Notice it printed out the solutions for AF, for AB, and for AD. And indeed, AF is the square root of 2 over A, AB is the square root of 2 over A, but the distinguishable case has a normalization of 2 over A. Notice that's just the square of the one-dimensional distinguishable particle, or the single distinguishable particle normalization function constant, but uh, I'll let you guys think about why this is a square root of 2 here for the boson and the fermion case. But the most important thing to notice is that the expectation value of the distance between the electrons, or fermions, we don't know that they're electrons, is 0.41a, whereas for the bosons it's 0.19a, and for the distinguishable particle it's 0.32a. So it's um, almost half an A for the fermions, a fifth of an A approximately for the bosons, and a third of an A for the distinguishable particles. So they're clearly different, and, uh, and that's what's interesting. Okay, so next we're going to move on from atoms. This, we're just getting a flavor of how this stuff works. We're going to move on and talk about solids. So first of all, we're going to start with the simplest possible treatment. We have non-interacting electrons in an empty box. So we're ignoring electron-electron repulsion, and we're ignoring the fact that the box is made of atoms. Uh, we introduce a concept of k-space. We get a Fermi energy out of that, and uh, we get a very important concept called the density of states. So I, I want to touch on all those things. Obviously, these are severe idealizations, but they're idealizations that are useful because it turns out that the dominant issue when you talk about electrons in a solid uh, doesn't turn out to be the atoms so much, especially in conductors, so like conducting metals. Uh, you can't really intelligently talk about insulators without discussing the atoms, but uh, anyway, let's move on. So the idea is, first of all, let's imagine this is the potential in the neighborhood of a single atom. It might look something like this. Uh, if I add more atoms, I get an overall potential that looks something like that. That might be what a one free electron would see inside of a, a solid. But if you average this over distances that are large compared to the atomic uh, spacing, you get an average potential that ends up looking something like that. And that's sort of the average potential we want to think about in dealing with the free electron model. So. Obviously, on a microscopic scale, it's not very accurate, but if you look on a large scale, uh, so for a long wavelength electron, for example, at a fairly low energy, this is going to be a reasonable approximation. And uh, we already know the answer. If you have a three-dimensional box like that, the, uh, you satisfy boundary conditions where the wave function goes essentially to zero at the boundaries, and you get uh, this result, which we're already familiar with. And what I want to do is start looking at counting the eigenstates. So I want you to imagine having a sort of a grid. And uh, the grid is in k space. So the horizontal direction is kx. And kx can be pi over the size in the x direction, 2 pi over the size, 3 pi over the size. So this, this would be sort of like pi over a, 2 pi over a, 3 pi over a. I've just generalized it a little bit to a cube that doesn't happen to have the same dimension on all three sides. Uh, what about in the uh, y direction? In the y direction, it's also uh, discrete k values, pi over l, 2 pi over l, 3 pi over l, like that. And finally, in the z direction, you get pi over l, 2 pi over l, 3 pi over l, and so on. Now let's imagine uh, counting 
or enumerating, I guess, the uh, the states that are available. Um, in the y direction, you could be in the pi over ly state, but uh, in the x direction, you could be in the pi over lx, the 2 pi over lx, the 3 pi over lx, and so on, the 4 pi over lx. But don't forget, you could also uh, have the y direction be 2 pi over ly, and the x direction be pi over lx, and so on. So you can imagine counting uh, more states that are available. And then finally, uh, we could start bumping up the z direction. So you could have pi over l in the z direction, and 2 pi over l, and so on. So you can see that in three-dimensional k space, the states that are available correspond to these discrete points that can either be occupied or not. That's kind of the idea. And uh, we need to be able to count and calculate uh, what the probability of these different states being occupied and so on and also to be able to count the total energy in the system depending on which states are occupied. That's kind of the idea. So I want to do another demo that sort of illustrates that in three dimensions. Hi guys, here's a, another cute little demo. Um, the idea here is to visualize k-space and there are two basic options uh, having to do with boundary conditions. So for example, you can choose Dirichlet boundary conditions, which are those we've been discussing where the wave function goes to zero at the edges of the three-dimensional box. And an alternative is periodic boundary conditions, where the wave function has to repeat every time it goes through a distance a. Um, I want to show you both of those so you can see the difference between the two. The other thing we can adjust is if uh, I have a limited set of 10 um, k values in each direction, so pi over a, 2 pi over a, 3 pi over a, up to 10 pi over a in the x direction, and then the same thing in the y direction and the same thing in the z direction. That'll give us a uh, 1,000 points in k-space, potentially. Uh, in one case, all of those are displayed, and it looks like a cube, and that would be all energies equals 1. The other case, down here, I'm calculating the energy of each point, and I'm only creating a representation of those points if they fall in the range that's less than the maximum for any one direction. So that'll give you an idea of what it looks like when you have uh, states that are limited by total energy. So when you're adding electrons to a solid at zero temperature, you know the electrons always go into the lowest states up to a maximum energy, and that produces a sort of a octant of a sphere in Dirichlet boundary conditions or a full sphere in periodic boundary conditions and I just wanted to show you sort of how that works. So for now let's look at Dirichlet boundary conditions with all energies. I'll go ahead and run the program and uh, you'll see here that you get something that looks sort of like a cube. There it is. Let me go ahead and make that a little bit bigger and uh, you can see that we have all the states all the way up to 10, 10 on each in each direction. And uh, that would be k-space. So this is the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction is blue. And uh, it's kind of, kind of fun to look at, but I hope that gives you an idea. Notice that um, this is sort of a cubic array of possible states. Okay, now what I want to do is uh, change this to Dirichlet, or to uh, non-Dirichlet. Let's look at periodic boundary conditions and you can see the difference. Now notice that the k values are no longer restricted to be positive only but they can be negative and you still get a kind of a cube but now it's 10 points on a side so there's only five on each side of the origin so the it looks like the density in k space is reduced by a factor of two but the density in energy is not any different because now um, for every point on this side, there's another point on that side. So the points are twice as far apart from each other, but now there's doubled the number. And so if you go th through and calculate the overall density, um, it turns out to be the same. Okay, let's see what happens if we uh, if we go to Dirichlet boundary conditions, but now we limit the energies to be within a certain range. This gives us a sort of a Fermi surface and you can see that now we've got a kind of a octant of a sphere and the spherical uh, surface is determined by the fact that the sum of the squares of the 
k values in the three different directions has to add up to something less than the maximum in this case. So you can kind of visualize the, uh, it's like you take an apple and slice it into halves in three directions, this is what you'd wind up with. Of course, if you go back to periodic boundary conditions, let's go ahead and do that. Then you get something that looks like a, a real sphere. So this is now a sphere in K space. Now it looks a little chunky because I've only got 10 uh, potential values of K in each direction. So just to show you that it smooths out if you go to larger numbers of K, uh, I'm going to go ahead and double this so you can see what it looks like with twice as many. And uh, we'll blow that out a little bit and then uh, look at it. It's a little sluggish because it's a lot more points to manage. But notice that that's looking yeah, pretty darn spherical. Uh, in a real situation, of course, 20 times 20 times 20, what is that? That's going to be 8,000 um, points. So that's uh, we've multiplied by 8 the number of points in k-space that we have. Uh, in a real system, of course, you're going to have something like Avogadro's number of states, and so these the spacing here would be much too small to even see. And uh, all right, so that gives you an idea, I hope, of what k-space looks like uh, when you're doing calculations. I find it useful to literally visualize, you know, that space and maybe draw some pictures to help you think about it, and uh, and so on. So good luck. Okay, and uh, finally. Uh, if we have time today, there's another uh, board work we're going to do. It's actually, I, I just want to take some time and go over that tutorial. The tutorial basically had a sequence of problems where you would work out the volume of a single state in k-space, compute energy eigenvalues of those points in k-space, and then calculate average, like the total energy, the Fermi energy, the pressure, stuff like that. So that's what we'll be doing if we have time in class. I'll try and go over some of the questions in that tutorial. I'll try to remind you also to bring your tutorial as much as of it as much of it as you've worked out to class so we can we can discuss that. All right, have a good one.